So thanks, thanks everyone to come in for a session and for everyone who dial in via video. Uh, we're going to talk today about Spiffy and Spire. Um, I hope some of you heard about it. If not, I'll do a quick recap. But the focus for this presentation is more around how to get Spire from proof of concept to production. I spent around the last five years, since like 2017, 2018, kind of barking on tree of uh, zero trust ideas and then following Spiffy Inspire project from the early days, been building different systems and uh, products around zero trust uh, using Spiffy Inspire underneath. I spent a couple of years at Bidance helping to rebuild authentication and authorization system using Inspire and this is the world largest deployment today, uh, running and scaling it beyond one million nodes. Um, since then, I kind of started to think that uh, it's very powerful technology, but it, it is kind of, you can think about set of building blocks. You need to turn it into a product. So I started thinking how to make this technology more accessible to uh, people and in 2020 we brought with a bunch of other smart forks a uh, book called uh, Solving the Bottom Turtle. Uh, we'll have a Spiffy Spire booth this year downstairs. Uh, it's a truly open source project, community driven, and thanks for CNCF to sponsoring it. Uh, we'll have hard copies of the book, so stop by and I have uh, three of them with myself here. Uh, if you have any questions, come and chase me. I'll give you a book and you can find probably five or six other co-authors for this book during CNCF and get signatures if you want. So uh, what is PIFI? I, I hope that everyone who came here is like heard about it or know, but here's a quick recap. It's basically a set of standards there are two projects, Spiffy and Aspire. Spiffy is basically a bunch of markdowns that describe what is what is a Spiffy identity, what is a Spiffy verifiable identity document. You can think about Spiffy ID as basically a URI string that's baked into identity that comes with the two formats. One is X509 and another one Jode. And it also describes things like what is a Spiffy trust bundle and how do you get it? And the biggest part of that is uh, workload API. Workload API is just basically a set of um, APIs. Obviously, how you can, how workload or application can get an identity, refresh identity, verify that identity, and uh, yeah. So this is just specification. Quick. What is this Spiffy ID and how it look like? As I mentioned, it's just a URI string. It has URI schema, it has a trust domain part, and it has a path. It's like pretty similar to URL, obviously, but it's only allowed path. It doesn't come with like other things. You can put anything into the uh, path, so it does need to be just one word as the name of your microservice. You can build the different schemas, for example, that would incorporate information like your, which region this workload is running or in which data center, etc. So it could be flexible, but there are certain limitations. So because it's going into Jod, for example, right? So it will have a certain limits on how much information you can put in there. And the same for X509. So uh, what's Spire? As I mentioned, Spiffy is just a standard and a Spire is a production ready implementation of the standard. It is an open source project, contains two main parts. One is a server and another one is an agent. So it's implement the whole specification and it contains a bunch of different plugins for attestation between agent to Aspire server and between workload to agent. So basically how it works, you put an agent on nodes, then you 
agents connect to a server, there is a certain attestation mechanism between agent and a server. For example, if you're running in a public cloud, you can use an identity documents for verification of firm agents and for that agent perform attestation for workload. So when workload connect over workload API to an agent to get an identity, basically it's process starts, goes to workload API and asks like, who am I? And there is an attestation kick in and provide workload with identity that it can use to go anywhere. Because it's two different formats, you can use it to build an MTLS, for example, uh, where you can use JOTS for authentication and then hook it up with authorization systems that you build on top of it. So typically when you kick off this, like I wanna use Spire, project, it goes into several stages. I kind of define this five stages, but it could be three because you squash like first three stages, research, feasibility, and proof of concept together. Uh, but what it do during this first three or one stage is basically trying to answer on different questions. Like, what is this? Do I really need it? I have a bunch of problems in my infrastructure and why I want to solve them, like some of them could be, we need MTLS or we need better kind of universal identity for everything so we can use it with authorization together. Um, and the goal there is to basically set, figure out set of use cases and priorities for your spiral rollouts. Is it MTLS is important or you want to use PFI identity for federation and to get some credentials that you store or secrets that you store in vaults. Or you can use it for federation between a different PFI identity aware systems. Or you can completely replace your static secrets like an API key is on or uh, AWS GCP identity is doing this PFI identity exchange to your cloud service provider exchange. Or you can do this like within any third party as well. Um, yeah, so this is just to help you get started. There's like lots of information you can find about use cases and how you can use PFI on website. You can go to and ask questions in Spiffy Slack. And I also build in collection of kind of very opinionated about different use cases uh, for Spiffy and Spire as well. So next stage is like when you define your priorities and uh, you want to get an internal buy-in from different from different parts of your company. It's like you need to talk to security, SRE, et cetera. And uh, this is where you normally build some proof of concept to show like how it will be looking when we get closer in production. And uh, what we see, lots of successful stories actually start with the Kubernetes rather than this kind of long tail of legacy or serverless. It's not like, I call legacy, it's not like a true legacy, it's more like applications that's running on dedicated nodes. It could be really modern applications, but it's a different mechanism how you can do things like deployment, registration, and attestation of your agents and workloads. So uh, Kubernetes is like really easy way to start and a really easy way to uh, prove the different use cases and get internal buy-in. But when you get to this stage, uh, you probably have lots of questions, right? We, it seems right thing to do. We love this use cases, we, write, we love technology. How do we run it in production now? And running things in production means different things if you go to developers or you go to SRE or you go to DevOps or you go to security, you'll hear different answers. So uh, if you go to SRE, you probably think that they will ask, is it scalable? Like how do you uh, prove that there is no downtime? Or what do you, 
like do you even have 24 by seven rotation and on call because this is authentication system. It will be kind of foundational for the rest of our applications to talk out and authenticate to each other. So uh, there are lots of questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll go through some stages. And my, my goal is to not to answer to all questions by give, but give you some mental framework, how you can think about what I need to do or what I need to think about before putting this into production. The first thing, you start with then understanding where your trust boundaries and how they map into spiffy trust domains. There's a different ways to think about it. You can have like traditional per environment trust boundaries and trust spiffy trust domains. So you have production environment and that it will be your one spiffy trust domain and your staging will be different. So they're kind of independent systems. Then the next thing you want to do is to think how this map into your PKI. So if you're building two independent spiffy systems, one is for production, one is for staging, one is for development, you probably want to have a different PKI right root for that and then you need to think where like what is the shape of your pki where do you store a key what's the ttl for all these keys how do you rotate them and how all this connected with uh, spire servers federation is another interesting thing because you can federate two independent spiffy systems to each other and uh, for example you can follow pattern like which Kubernetes use, where you have one uh, PKI for Kubernetes cluster, this is your blast radius, this is your trust domain, this is your spiffy domain. But if you have multiple Spire clusters and Kubernetes cluster, then you have too many entities to manage, right? In order for them to talk to each other, like application deployed on 10 different clusters, you need to federate spiffy identities between all of them, and that would basically affect your bundle size, right? So you, you will need to have a lot of root keys and that bundle, the, the size is growing. If you use JOT, uh, the number of keys there is also will be growing. So it's all, all kind of can affect your performance. And I think when you go in like beyond 10 entities, maybe you should start thinking about a different shape or a different architecture for Spire. Um, trust model also goes pretty close with investment into how many things you need to build on your own in order to run Spire. This is kind of, I'm trying to give an idea if you trust something, this is how much less or more you need to build. So for example, if you're talking, if you want to run Spire with the Kubernetes and you trust Kubernetes control plane, so you can use Kubernetes primitives like a daemon set for deployment of Spire agent. You can use Spire controller manager for the registration of Spire, uh, of your workloads, and you can use a Kubernetes PSAT for attestation. If you do not trust Kubernetes control plane, you'll need to build all this, right? And, and it's all depend on their, uh, how you deploy applications, right? Whether it's like one cluster or multiple of them. There are couple more talks uh, by Uber, uh, Tyler, and Tyler, how you can think about their scheduler integration with Spire. Um, and as an example, if you use a, you deploy a cloud service provider like AWS, GCP, Azure, and you do not trust it, so this is probably pretty hard in terms of like how do you do attestation in this case, if you do not trust your cloud service provider, uh, probably you can rely on something like a VTPM for not attestation, but it, you need to do research. I, I, I don't actually know if that's possible completely to do, but that could be like one of the directions. Uh, another thing you 
want to focus on is like what are the what will be the Spire architecture that you use for the deployment? Uh, it's a pretty big topic. Evan gave a pretty good overview. I think it's like a 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, so here's the link. Uh, I'll put a slide and so you can click and find it. So don't worry about that. Uh, but yeah, basically there are a few models that Spire support. One is a single uh, Spire server or a cluster. Obviously for a high availability, you want to have a multiple version of Spire running. Uh, to make sure that there is no downtime. Nested model is pretty good in, in cases when you want to run Spire and use different attestation primitive, let's say, for different clouds and for your on-prem deployment. Is it one Spire server per cluster in the nested model? Uh, you, can, you can run multiple of them. And federated is another model, so you, you might run one Spire deployment in your on-prem environment and another one in the cloud when you're migrating in there. You can federate these two systems, whether mutually, so your workloads running in public cloud, they can talk to your workloads on-prem, uh, or you can do directional, right? Your on-prem workloads would be able to talk to cloud, but not other way. Um, again, so there are more information on this link. It's a great video. So um, the trade-offs that you'll be doing, or like I want you to think about different trade-offs when you're thinking about architecture and how to deploy Spire in production. Uh, usually when you're talking about security and availability, these kind of two trade-offs that's coming in, manageability is another one, and a cost factor is another thing that's unique to think about. Um, the good example for this could be we have 10 Kubernetes clusters in production, right? Uh, we want to we run each cluster in different availability zones. So to build and to have Spire in highly available mode, you want to run one Spire server at least per availability zone. So you ended up with at least three, now multiply it by 10 clusters, you'll get to like 30 instances at least. And then that's for availability. Then you think about security. Hmm, I probably don't want my production workloads like an application running on the same node as a Spire server. Because if that workloads get compromised, potentially ye, that would be a way for an attacker to get into the Aspire server. So we want to run them on dedicated node, right? And now you're talking about the cost, right? Because now you have basically 30 nodes that only run in Aspire server. You can't, you can't run anything else in there at that, that could be like pretty costly. And this like, if you find yourself in this situation, probably you wanna rethink your architecture and do not run Spire inside their Kubernetes clusters and run dedicated clusters of a Spire server. And in this case, if you talk about, let's say East Coast and the West Coast, have a two clusters with N plus two availability, you'll have a three servers in each region and that would be six nodes compared to 30. So there, there's always kind of balance between things. Uh, data store, and when it's come to production, is an, another, interesting, another interesting piece, and it's kind of when we wrote a book about all these turtles all the, way, all, all, all the way down, basically Spire is your systems that provide identities to everything in your infrastructure but it needs a database. So how do you authenticate your database? So you're kind of getting into this secure self-bootstrap mode. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing is like you probably noticed there is like a meta, meta PKI because we've been building at ByteDance everything internally. Uh, we had this kind of smaller turtle, smaller infrastructure that's been running and we used it for authentication between Spire server 
and database. There, the biggest challenge there is like if you use a, if it's come to a database like a Postgres or a MySQL, you normally people use like username and password. How do you rotate them, right? Uh, rotation in Spire Server world, world requires server restart. Now you're talking about availability. And uh, then database is a usually bottleneck if you have many, many nodes and workloads, like if you're talking about more than 10th of thousand of them. Um, my bottle, <laughs> bottom line would be if you're running a cloud service provider, it's better to use their primitives for database authentication and use managed database. If you running it on-prem and you're building the database, it's a little bit more challenging. That's, this is where you need like a meta PKI thing. Um, it was a great talk by Matthew from Square about how they build and scale a database on-prem for their, with much more details than I can package into 25 minutes. Uh, performance, probably the question you will get often from SRE DevOps uh, platform teams. It basically boils down that things are much better now than it was two years ago. If you running, if your scale is less than 10K nodes and you don't have like, I don't know, hundreds of thousand microservices running, you probably shouldn't worry about it. You, you likely won't run into any challenges in there. But there will be some links for additional resources like how you can think about the sizing um, of your Aspire clusters and what node types and what, how much resources you need depends on how many workloads you have. Monitoring and alerting. We hear this a lot from SRE team, like, hmm, how do you know it's working? How do we know that it's not broken? Uh, what's gonna happen if it's down? Do you have like, on-call rotation for this. So Spire provides a lot of telemetry for both servers and agents, though there is no dashboards. It's kind of, you need to build it. You need to understand what's important for you because Spire is a lot of, as I mentioned before, building, building blocks. And for example, anything related to data store, it could be data store specific and you probably want to have more metrics from your data store. But uh, help wanted if you want to contribute and help uh, with the community. This is like one of the things that we're looking help with. And I wanna quickly touch base about logging and alerting. This is kind of two th systems that's also kind of, we always tend to think at the end. Uh, there is one important thing though for you need to bring your own logging and auditing systems. And uh, Spire can be plugged into that pretty easily. But one thing I wanted to point out here is specifically to auditing, Spire server log contains a lot of information about agent attestation, but agents contain information about workload attestation. It's like basically based on what condition this workload been given some identity. This information is like very useful for detection and response purposes. It's very useful for like, I don't know, some incident response that's happened three months ago. You probably want to preserve this information specific to attestation for longer time, like one or two years probably, but you'll need to kind of, this is something that you'll need to build. It's not. There is just log file, basically, in Aspire. And the, the last thing I wanna quickly emphasize is on disasters and, and recovery, like different scenarios and your comfort level. You probably want to start with a very high TTL for your identity, so I would recommend like 30 days probably before you get comfortable, uh, and then build a plan how you lower it down. The big issue is there is like, if Spire server is down, then your nothing is working, right? So everything that's already have identities will be able to use it. But if they will expire, 
then everything, like you don't have authentication, everything is broken. So your level of comfort is just basically how quickly you can rebuild an infrastructure. And the way we thought about it is like, if you burn down the Spire Infra right now, if we can rebuild it in one hour, so that double this is like how level of comfort for how, how long we wanna issue this identity. So it's like two hours in this case, right? They give us some room to breathe. Um, yeah, automate everything from start to finish, uh, test everything, do different game day activities and house engineering. The, the big message here is just make sure you're comfortable to, and you understand what's happening when you, when something goes wrong, like especially for monitoring and alerting. Um, yeah, so uh, there are some links for additional resources on this slide. If you have any issues or have questions, uh, find me, go to spiffy.io slack. And uh, thank you everyone for coming in here today. No, it's not the uh, at the bottom of the supply chain. Okay. The, the the question is whether Spire is for workload attestation or for software attestation, right? So uh, the my the main goal of Spire is to provide identities to workloads and help to verify these identities. And identities came in two formats, X509 and JWT tokens. It doesn't do, in the process of providing these identities, Spire agent does some measurement, right? So, but you need to know in front of, like before providing these identities, you need to know something about it, right? Like what user it's running, if it's un under, if it's Unix process, right? Or if you're running it on Kubernetes, what container image it's using, for example. So it does this measurement, but it's different from like software supply chain, for example, right? So, thank you. Any other questions? I would suggest to think from there, yeah, in, in, in this way, right? So it's like, I don't remember what's the default TTL, probably one hour. Uh, I think it's too low, like, because if something goes wrong, you literally have a certain minutes to recover. If that's your level of comfort, this is great. I think we started with like seven days or, or, or something like this when we rolled out in production or maybe even like 30 days before you get comfortable and uh, operational teams also trust you, right? Because remember, this is, everything depends on it in your infrastructure. Cool, any, any other questions? All right, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for coming in.